When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. I love this little glimpse that we get into the life of the disciples. And of all of the disciples, I think Thomas is one of my favorites. I think he gets a bad rap sometimes, right? Doubting Thomas, we call him. But I like to think of him instead as as double-checking Thomas, right? Or verifying Thomas. Just making sure, Thomas, right? Thomas is the skeptic of the group. Every group needs a skeptic. You know, in most relationships, you'll realize uh, there's usually one who believes pretty easily and then one who questions everything, right? I married the world's biggest skeptic. Okay, so in our relationship, I am the believer, but Tim has to question everything, right? He takes things at face value. He never takes things at face value. He always has to ask. Um, I will trust somebody until they give me a reason not to. Tim is the opposite. He doesn't trust anybody until you give him a reason to. We balance each other out that way. But here in Scripture, we see that what Thomas is really asking for is proof, right? And to be fair, he's only asking for what the other disciples already experienced, right? They already got to see Jesus' resurrected body. Thomas just wasn't there the first time around when Jesus showed up, so he missed it, and now he wants to see for himself. And you know, he's not the only disciple who is a fact-checking, verifying disciple, right? Um, When the women came from the empty tomb and first told the disciples, what was the first thing they did? Jumped out and went to the tomb and verified that it was empty, right? So, oh, that's all that Thomas is doing, right? He's just verifying. He's just asking those hard questions. Um, Instead of accepting the situation as someone else has told it to him, he wants to experience it firsthand, right? He wants to know for certain. He wants to navigate his own way through his skepticism, through his doubts, by asking these questions. Fortunately for us, doubt is not a sin, right? Skepticism is not a sin. Nowhere in scripture have I ever read, thou shalt not doubt, right? Or thou shalt not question, Now, I have read um, the phrase, you know, have faith as we're following God. Do not fear. Peace be with you. Um, And the phrase that we should press on and run the race that God has set before us. Last week, we got to celebrate Easter. We got to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. We got to celebrate the empty tomb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last week, Easter Day, marks that that linchpin in the Christian calendar, the day on which every other Sunday hangs, 
right? We are an Easter people. It's why we show up every Sunday morning that we get to live into this resurrection, accepting Christ's forgiveness and mercy that was given on the cross, that was poured out in his blood. But the story doesn't stop right there. You know, a lot of Christians, that's, that's the end, right? The tomb is empty. Yay! And that's true. But there's more, right? Jesus comes back, gives some more instructions, right? You know, when we give our hearts to Jesus, he doesn't just ask us to leave our brain behind, right? Jesus doesn't just want our heart. He wants the whole total package, the heart, the brain, the body, and all, right? Jesus doesn't ask us to stop questioning, to stop thinking, to stop wondering, um, to stop seeking God's truth in our lives. Thank goodness. Just because we give our heart to Christ doesn't mean we shouldn't also give God our brain. Don't check your brain at the door. This is a phrase I say often when you're coming into the church, when you're encountering scripture, um, don't check your brain at the door. I say this especially to our confirmation classes. I've had the joy and the privilege of teaching confirmation to our young folks um, over many, many years in my lifetime. And it's one of the favorite things that I get to do as part of my job. It's this really great process, basically this class, where we get to go over all of the major aspects of our faith, right? We get to talk about baptism and the sacraments. We get to talk about how God is a triune God. We get to learn and grow and ask those really deep questions. We get to confirm, right? We get to verify. We get to strengthen our faith foundation. And if you ever want to strengthen your faith, I encourage you to come and be a part of our confirmation class or walk alongside one of our youth as their friend in faith because let me tell you folks, our youth will ask you the hard questions. They are not afraid to ask the questions about, you know, how was the Bible written down? Who wrote it down? And, and who, uh, you know, decided what books were in and what was not? Who put it together in, in that format? Um, who translated it? They'll ask questions about the character of God or the nature of God. They'll ask questions about the Trinity. You know, how is God three and one and one and three? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's great big metaphysical questions. They'll ask questions about eternity. They'll ask hard questions about heaven and hell and what happens next. So if you want to grow in your faith, I invite you to come and hang out with our teenagers for a little while. But there's this point during every confirmation class that happens every year that without fail, a parent will come to me and say, you know, I thought this was supposed to make their faith stronger, but my kid is asking all of these hard questions and they're starting to wonder, or they're starting to question things that I thought they were sure about, and they might have some doubts now. And I look at those parents and I say, praise God, that's exactly what we wanted. Because if the only thing your child ever knows is I believe in God because mama and daddy told me that was what I was supposed to do, or I believe this because that's what a pastor said this one time, then when they go out and face the world, that faith does not stand up. It crumbles, right? We want them to keep going. We want them to question. We want them to go out and experience it for themselves. Go seek the truth for yourself. The truth is out there, right? The reason that confirmation classes work is because we don't stop in the valley of the doubt. We keep going. We work through the hard questions. And we come through that valley of skepticism stronger on the other side, together, as a group. Doubt is okay. Questioning is okay. Staying there is not okay. Keep learning, keep growing, keep wondering, keep marveling at the awesome things that God is doing and the way that God is moving. It's hard to do sometimes when we are, you know, having a crisis of faith or when we're just tired, when we're exhausted in our faith, when we are worn out, when we experience trauma or when we see something in the world that just doesn't make sense when we experience hurt or when we look at the broken in the world, when we are going through our own dark night of the soul, the important thing is to keep going, right? There's this really great quote by Winston Churchill, although he never actually said it, I don't think it's, um, when you're going through hell, keep going. Don't stop there. That's a terrible place to stop, right? 
When you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, keep walking. Don't live there. Don't set up your house there. And the great news is that God does not expect us to do this all on our own, right? When we are going through the valleys, we don't have to just stumble around through the dark. God gives us guideposts. God gives us a way that lights the way. God gives us people to journey with us through those tough times. God gives us scripture that we can look to. God gives us examples that we can look to and look up to. It's part of why sharing our testimony of what God is doing in our lives is so important as a Christian, because we need to edify one another in the body of Christ. So when we wonder, when we doubt, when we feel lost in our faith, it's so important to look for those landmarks, to look for those guideposts on our journey. How many of y'all have seen the movie Finding Dory? Anybody else love the movie Finding Dory? Okay, it's a really great movie. Um, talk about a character that is lost a lot. Dory is a fish who gets hopelessly lost all the time and cannot find her way back to her parents, right? So in the movie, when Dory is a little baby fish, um, her parents know that she gets lost often, so they have this system that they've built where they set out little purple seashells in a path all the way to their house so that when Dory gets lost, she just has to look for the purple seashell and she can follow the path all the way back home, right? And surprise, surprise, in the movie, Dory gets lost as an adult. She goes on an adventure. She finds Nemo, right? And in, and in this uh, sequel to Finding Nemo, there's this really beautiful scene where she remembers the purple seashell and she sees it and, and she finds that at the end, her parents never stopped setting out purple seashells for her. That you see this miles and miles of purple seashells going out in every direction, just, just searching for her and guiding her. It's this beautiful picture of how a parent never gives up hope and always loves and always uh, provides a way for their child to come back home when they're lost. In the same way, our heavenly parent sets out those purple seashells for us and sets out those guideposts for us when we feel lost. God puts out those examples and those people and those miracles for us to follow in our faith until we can come to a place of belief again, until we can come to a place um, where we're secure in our faith again. Jesus didn't leave Thomas in doubt, right? He showed up and he showed him. He said, look, this is my nail-scarred body. These are my hands. This is the hole in my side. Come, feel, and believe, right? Jesus met Thomas exactly where he was in the middle of his skepticism, in the middle of that valley of doubt, and said, come and believe. Christ does the same for us. Our lives are filled with these everyday commonplace miracles that point to God if we will open our eyes and see them. We woke up this morning. We had breath in our lungs. We had blood pumping through our heart. That's a miracle. We are able to gather together as a body of believers and not worry about persecution. That is a miracle. The earth kept rotating and the sun rose this morning. That is a miracle. <clears throat> if you go outside and you go for a walk and you just marvel at God's creation, there are so many miracles to enjoy. And if you need some more examples of miracles, I invite you to go and just take a peek in our nursery sometime. We have several little miracles in there right now. We, we just happen to have a very full nursery right now. Um, the most common, beautiful, everyday miracle, um, welcoming a new child into the world. How, what a great example of how, how God uh, is living and active in the life of God's church. I'm a little biased because one of them's mine, right? <laughs> But, but I also don't like it when pastors stand up here and say, of course, I've never doubted. That's all in the past, right? No, our, our sweet little miracle took years of struggle and doubt and anger and hope and prayer and faith, and then more struggle and doubt and anger, and then more hope and prayer and faith. And it kept going. But look at the beautiful reward at the end of that rainbow, right? God is so good. God is so, so good. So when you 
Find yourself, like Thomas, seeking truth. Keep seeking. Don't stop. It's okay if you're going through a hard time. It's okay if you're going through a crisis of faith. It's okay if you're mad at God. It's okay if you're not certain in your faith. What's not okay is to stay there, right? Keep going. Keep looking. Keep searching. Reach out to someone who can help you. Reach out into scripture and find those purple seashells that God has left for you, right? leading you back to that place of security, that place of belief and faith. Because when we finally do come out on the other side of that valley, we come back with a faith that is stronger than the faith that we had before. We come back um, with a faith that can stand up to the questions of the world, to the brokenness of this world, um, that can make a difference in this broken world that we have. We'll have a faith that's been refined by fire, that can stand up, uh, to the, the hardest of hardships. So as the band comes back up, um, I invite you to pray with me as we, as we seek that faith together as a church body. God, we invite you to journey with us in our valley of unbelief, to journey with us as we uh, continue to seek you, God, no matter what place we're in, whether it's a valley of doubt or whether we are absolutely standing on the mountaintop sure of our faith, God, we ask that you would point out to us those everyday miracles, those purple seashells, those guideposts along the way so that we can become even closer to you as we continue to walk, as we continue to grow, as we continue to learn, as we continue to seek you in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.